Our next paper by uh, Dr. Graham Reed. Dr. Reed's the professor of silicon photonics and group leader, recently joining Southampton from the University of Surrey. And I think his latest uh, exciting work is to have a 50 gigabit modulator. Uh, well, I'm not really talking about that. But <laughs> All right. That was, that was, I think, maybe that was 2011, I think. Yeah, this yeah. is an out-of-date bio. <laughs> anyway, thank you for the introduction. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, uh, this was the title. Well, f actually, remiss of me not to thank Kim for inviting me. I beg your pardon. Uh, great to be back in Boston, although it would be nice if it was a bit warm. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, this is a title that Kim gave me, uh, and it fits with um, what he really wants me to talk about. And he knows what we're doing because he's part of our steering committee on this, um, this large project called Silicon Photonics for Future Systems. So I just want to correct a little thing that you said earlier. You, you talked about um, uh, a program called UK Silicon Photonics. Actually, that was the previous grant. Um, the current grant is this one called Silicon for Photonics for Future Systems. So I'm not sure if you remember UK Silicon Photonics because that was really successful or because this one's not so successful. But hopefully I can convince you we're doing some good stuff in this as well. Um, anyway, so I didn't actually have any slides on the program, so I found a few on my, uh, on my laptop just to introduce it and give you an idea of, of the sort of things we're doing. So um, it's a, it's a six-year program. It started in 2013, and the previous one, UKSP, ended in 2012. So more or less, it's a, it's a follow-on program from the previous one. Um, there are five research challenges which really map to work packages, which I'll describe in the, uh, in the next slide. And uh, we have three industry partners, one international partner, and we've, called, we've got this uh, term associate partner to enable us to bring in new folks, but the core uh, team are all University of Southampton folks. Um, so we have you know, a variety of stuff. We obviously have students. We have uh, quite a, a large number of uh, postdoctoral research associates. Uh, we have project manager. And I just wanted to draw your attention to one thing called the Innovation Fund, which is some funding that's ring-fenced to enable us to bring in new people um, where we need additional expertise and so on. Um, so it's a way in which we bring in small um, projects, sort of starter projects, into the program for tryouts to enhance the, uh, the capability that's already within the program. So that's quite nice. Um, so this is, the, um, uh, this is supposed to represent the five challenges within the, uh, the program. So technically, it's something called a program grant. So it's funded by the Engineering and uh, Physical Sciences Research Council, or EPSRC in the UK. Um, and their uh, flagship programs are called program grants. Uh, and the idea of a program grant is that you can have a multidisciplinary team and you can keep them together and, they, and they're supposed to deliver more than the sum of the parts. Um, so as I said, this followed on from the UKSP program. And the UKSP program was really focusing on transceiver type components and circuits. So we, you know, we looked at what we would, should do next. And so we were looking at things that really um, are not the sort of core technology of, um, at least at that time, of transceiver type uh, components, but things that at that point were sort of seen to be a little bit more on the periphery. So things like uh, packaging, which I, by which I mean passive alignment, multi-layer photonics, uh, wafer scale testing. Um, we do a little bit about uh, getting lasers on chip. Um, and so we, we go from the sort of flip chip bonding that you were hearing about in the previous talk um, to more academic endeavors like um, uh, optical tweezers and, and so on. And then there is this sort of central uh, activity surrounding transmitters and in particular modulators. And so I'm not going to talk about all of this today. I'm going to focus on one uh, particular element of, of uh, 
uh, what's done in the uh, in the um, the modulator work. So I've uh, I've put this slide up. This is a slide I sort of used last year, just to demonstrate um, that I, well, I think that our group's uh, best known probably for the modulator work, and it does go back quite a long time. So. You can see that we actually fabricated our first uh, silicon photonics modulator way back in 1993. Uh, and then we went on to do a, a series of things uh, throughout the subsequent years, um, you know, including sort of first design for a gigahertz, the first depletion modulator design, first 40 gig with large extinction, and so on and so on. Now, the interesting thing about this is that all of this um, is really about device optimization. Now, when we got to about 50 gig, which actually was in 2012, it looks like, um, a lot of the focus was now moving to energy. Um, and so, you know, we started to focus a little bit more on, um, on the energy modulator relationship. But the point of this slide is that what we really did here was look at the optics over here, and then the drivers over there. Um, you know, took the, um, the spec over here and made a driver over here to do something with this optical device over here. I never really brought them um, together in the, at the design phase. So that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about. I just wanted to make the other point, though, that um, we have worked on a whole bunch of types of, um, of different modulators. So most of what we've done has been in depletion devices, whether it be in max enders or rings, but mostly in max enders. But we've worked on things like slow wave devices, QCSEs. And if you were here last year, I talked a little bit about electroabsorption modulators um, in, uh, in silicon germanium and how to try and arrive at uh, uh, different wavelength based devices um, if you want really low power uh, modulators. Um, but today I'm going to talk about um, back to depletion devices and the sort of thing we've been doing there. So here is an example of that 2011 modulator. Uh, it's essentially just uh, a PN junction somewhere in the waveguide. You can see that this one is sort of over to one side. You know, sometimes we make them in the middle. Sometimes we make them right at the edge. Um, I mean, the point of this self-aligned process is that however you make them, they end up being the same each time and manufacturable, uh, and so on and so forth. And so if you're not familiar with this, this is the, the mechanism of moving carriers around to change the refractive index and therefore cause a phase shift. Use a max ender to convert that phase shift into an intensity change. And here is a, 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 a wavelength scan you know, showing um, how at these different voltages, the, um, the responses move around, and therefore you get a, um, a shift in the, uh, the optical performance. And similarly, um, you can plot things slightly differently, and you see that you can trade off um, the rate at which you accumulate phase shift with um, either the length um, or the loss, or indeed the, the voltage over here. And so, my view of these type of modulators is basically everything's a trade-off uh, to arrive at the performance you want in any given circumstance. So this is a, a slide now to show you that, again, I think I put a similar one up last year. But this is to show you how we started looking at drivers. So we did this work on optical modulators, and then we started looking at drivers. So. Um, now, we started doing this in, in around about 2011. And you'll see that we started at a, a fairly large technology node, primarily because as a university, um, when you go to a foundry, electronics foundry like this, it's very expensive. And so if we jumped straight into 28 nanometers and, and uh, you know, learned how to do it at that point, it would have been much more expensive. So we started in the, uh, the bigger technology nodes and gradually worked our way up to um, paying bigger money once we knew what we were doing. And you can see that um, these are the speeds of the drivers, not the modulators here. Um, and you can see that we gradually go up in technology node, and as you would expect, the drivers get quicker, the power consumption comes down, 
and then the corresponding energy per bit number is over here. Now, what I'm going to talk about today uh, is the, um, the integration of one of these drivers in the 28 nanometer uh, technology node with um, one of those depletion um, modulators. And I can't remember if I talked about this last year, but it's possible. But we basically either wire bond these devices together or we flip chip them. Uh, we've had wire bonding capability for quite a while. We've been uh, developing flip chipping more recently um, and uh, now have a, um, a sensible way of doing that. Um, so this figure from, from 2017 gives you a whole transmit function, you know, electronics driver onto the modulator for round about one and a half picojoules per bit for 3 dB extinction. And as I said, what I'm now going to talk about is this flip chip bonding um, um, version of the same modulator, but also the same driver. You know, not, well, not actually the very same, but the, from the same batches each time. Um, because it's an interesting story. Um, but let me just draw your attention to this number, because this number of nearly 100 milliwatts running at 40 gig, I think we can do much better than that. But actually, this data was only taken on Saturday while I was on the plane. Um, so, you know, you, you can see that we'll probably do a bit better. Okay. So, eventually I get to the outline of my talk. So, um, this is the, the first element, so let's get on with, uh, with that. So, if you look at drivers, the way people do drivers, uh, they tended to start off with a Max Zender and drive, you know, a, a sort of push-pull type Max Zender with a driver for each arm, driving the whole arm. And then, more recently, people started looking at um, segmenting these drivers um, such that you get, uh, within each segment, you get a high efficiency um, drive. But of course, what you have to do is match up all the phase shifts from this section to this section, both electrically and optically and so on. Um, so it adds to the complexity. But nevertheless, I don't want you to think I don't think this is, um, has a lot of potential because we're also doing this, but it's just not quite what I'm going to talk about today. But it is, um, you know, it's, com it's, it's a complex way of arriving at a good solution in my view. Um, anyway, so if you look at um, sort of research foundries like IMEC and IME and so on, what you can do now is you can get resistive terminations um, for these types of devices within the photonics layer. And so you don't have to have an external um, termination. You can just make these resistors directly on the photonics chip. But you still obviously need an electronics chip um, over here as, as your driver uh, and so on. And so even when you do this, your optical and your electrical de designs are uh, significantly separated. So um, what we wanted to do was look at bringing these together. And so you know, this is getting more like electronics, where you involve uh, all of your design in the, at the design stage and the concept um, in order to improve pretty much everything. Uh, now, what we've done before is we've designed the modulator for efficiency. We've designed the electronic device for low power. But we've done it separately. And so what you therefore do is something like this. You make a, a driver, you put it on your Max Zender, and you have some terminations which may be on this chip, or they may even be external. Um, or if you're thinking more of the application um, for you know, full on chip, fully integrated, you might embed the entire, or at least aim to the, embed the entire structure uh, 
um, within what is probably an electronic uh, PDK. Um, but of course, what you end up with is some advantages, but also some challenges. In particular, um, a probably a very good big footprint. But the but uh, the questions surround really perhaps the signal integrity, and I'll kind of come back to that a bit later. So some of the enhancements um, that, that make a difference are sometimes incredibly simple. And so what I'm going to describe here is just a very simple change to the modulator, which has lots of benefits. So now here's the driver. So this is the modulator. So if you look, we have grating couplers here and here. So the optical axis is in this direction. Then the electrical chips here. So this is the optical chip. So we're feeding a Mach Zender. And this is one arm of the Mach Zender, and this is the other. And so the modulator is now a U-shape uh, structure. So it's conceptually uh, no different. It's a very simple change. But what it means is that all of the electrical terminations are over here. All of the electrical access is on the, um, the electrical chip. Um, now, in order, to, again, to save money, because um, you know, we're a university, we also took the opportunity to do what we've called common center topology here, because that means with the same devices, we can either wire bond them or we can flip chip them. What it means is that this driver is symmetrical about the middle. So I can physically place it next to the optical chip like this, and I can wire bond across from one to the other. Or I can take the same thing and turn it over and align the centers again. And because it's symmetrical, it now flip chips onto um, the optical chip as well. So in other words, the same um, device just does the same thing for both functions purely by the geometry of the, uh, of the device. And so now I can have my terminations on chip, I, uh, you know, along with, I mean, on the electronics chip, I mean, along with um, the driver and so on. Um, what we can also do is add in things like impedance control. So we've got impedance control on this chip. Um, so we can, you know, we're sort of nominally working at a 50 ohm matching here, but we can play around to enhance the, uh, the impedance because it's not quite 50 ohms or because uh, the characteristic impedance is you know, a little bit off. Um, and you know, at, at different bias points, we might need something different, and so on and so on. So you can see that just by putting in um, variable drive to some capacitors, we can play around with impedance control as well. And so it means that at the high end, um, we can tweak things a little bit more. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's look at actually putting these two things together. And I'll start with the wire bonding and then come on to the flip chip. Um, so here's conceptually what's going on. So we've got our, this is for the wire bonded version. So we've got our, um, our driver chip here, the um, optical chip here, and we're wire bonding across to this U-shaped uh, Mach Zender. Um, it means we have more scope, as I mentioned, to uh, play around with a variety of the electrical signals. Um, we can do different types of biasing. We can do different types of, um, of uh, signal processing, impedance control, and, and conditioning, and, and all that sort of stuff. Because we've got access both to the transmit end, but also the receive end of the Mach Zender on the electrical chip. And that's really the main advantage from this very simple change from you know, a through uh, or linear um, structure to this U-shaped device. And so here's some wire bonding uh, results. And in fact, this is the one that was quoted in that table earlier, about 33 milliwatts at 22 gigabit per second. 
which is about one and a half picojoules per bit. But obviously, you can drive um, these things a little bit differently to get a different extinction and a, um, you know, a somewhat different result. And obviously, the eyes are, are changing a little bit accordingly. So just to show you how the impedance control can make a bit of difference. So here, again, is the same thing, but playing around with uh, the impedance matching element. And so you can see what actually happens is you change the jitter. And, and you can see that this is starting to get worse than this over here. Um, and so you get a, um, a slightly worse extinction ratio and slightly worse jitter for basically the same um, functionality, just by tuning um, or changing the bias on the capacitors a little bit on that chip. So that's just one example of how you can um, play around with the control. So here we have that, uh, that whole thing now described again. And so there's a couple of things I just wanted to point out. So as you would expect, the bonding wires um, are an issue. You know, they have um, parasitics associated with them, in particular inductance, and you sometimes get ringing or, um, you know, e at least uh, additional noise. Um, and so this can limit both the speed but also the ability to use slightly more complex uh, modulation schemes such as PAM4, as we've, uh, we've heard earlier today. So what happens if you go to flip chip? Because you, you obviously start to um, get rid of the, the wire bonding uh, lines and so on. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, this uh, common center topology means I can now flip my um, device over. Obviously, I have to put in um, bump bonds. And so what we do is just apply these, um, these solder bumps onto that chip, and we're going to flip chip it across onto here, uh, as this schematic shows. And so there's the device actually in situ. So remember, this is the same um, design of, um, of, uh, of uh, modulator in these U-shaped. You can see there are three different ones on this particular optical chip, all of different lengths. Um, and this is the inverted driver, so it's now face down. So rather than now just putting it close to the optical chip, we've got a silicon interposer here to enable um, just to get the, you know, the relative levels right and the geometry right and so on, so that we can flip it over. Um, and what you see is that suddenly we, with those very same um, modulators, which incidentally um, were only, even when probed, were only about um, 20 gigabit per second, now go to 40 gigabit per second. Um, the, the bit we don't really understand is, uh, uh, and as I mentioned, it was, it's only a couple of days ago, is that the power consumption is higher than we actually expected. And so the picojoule per bit number uh, is correspondingly worse than we would expected, but the, um, but the signals are better. Um, so it may just be that it's that particular um, driver, and in the fullness of time doing this again, um, we, we may just find that uh, we were unlucky with that one, um, but we'll see. Or, or obviously it may be something else as well. So what else can we do? Well, I mentioned that, uh, well, actually, let me just take a, a step back. Uh, I suppose it's not obvious that this is better in terms of eye diagram from the previous one. Um, the jitter numbers are not actually on this slide. But um, what we see is that we can just, you know, within this, uh, this same driver chip, we can now for example, we can run PAM4 relatively easily by just putting in two different signals. And you can see we can just change the amplitude of those two signals to get the, uh, the PAM4 signal. So um, we don't need a, a DAC. We can just run it directly like that. And you know, here's an example of, uh, of doing that. 
Um, what's interesting about this is I didn't mention this before, but if you if you just run one of these types of modulators with probes, you'll find that they're non-linear. Uh, and so if you then ran a, a PAM4 signal, you would typically find that this eye opening is bigger than these two because of the non-linearity of the device. But obviously, you can compensate for that in your design. And so you can see that now um, they're all sort of fairly similar. So it also shows that the linearity of that, um, that driver is also good. So finally, um, just a, a few summing up comments, really. Um, so what we will do is study the effect with different lengths of um, these U-shaped modulators. And so one thing you can see immediately is that things like uh, the DC impedances will vary just because you've got you know, different track lengths and all of that sort of thing. But you ought to be able to deal with that type of thing because you've got all the signals um, coming back to the same CMOS point. Um, and this really just comes down to the co-design of the, um, the devices rather than treating them separately, as I mentioned before. And so to give you an example of what you might be able to do, therefore, is if I'm driving you know, my uh, Mac Zander here and the far end of the RF line is coming out here, I can look at the quality of that signal and I can, for example, play around with the bias to improve it. So I can do effectively on-chip um, correction because I've now got access to the, the receive end, you know, the far end, um, as well as just the launch end of... Uh, of um, the microwave signal. And so that's just one example of how we can uh, improve things doing this sort of thing. So if you go back to this slide, what we really were doing, if you think of it like this, is if you're the electronics guy designing the drivers, then you just think of the optical device as a black box. Um, and you, you, know, you, you know what the RF loss is, you know what the V pi is, the length, et cetera, and you get that from the optics guy, and you design your um, device accordingly, rather than doing what is obvious, really, um, which is co-designing from the word go, um, and looking at the whole thing as if it were one, um, one device. And so, you know, it seems, now that we've taken that view, it seems obvious, and I guess uh, I'm aware that other folks are, uh, are also doing this, but it makes such a difference to uh, what you can do to the quality of the signal. And so I'll just finish by acknowledging, again, the funding from EPSRC and also a little bit from the Royal Society for an uh, um, award I was uh, given by them. So thank you very much. I think we might have time for just one question. Well, I had one on the, um, when you flip the chip, did it, was there additional capacitance between the bond pad and the pad that you were driving on the optical chip? Well, I don't actually know. Um, there's less than um, the corresponding wire bonding um, but I don't know what the state of the original device is without, if you see what I mean. Um, but I guess so. Well, um, I was suspecting that might be where your power... Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you would assume there is, right? Right. Um, well, you don't model that. That's the problem. Is that no, that's no right. Yeah, yeah. This is not modeled and, in here. And, so. you know, I would... You know, I'm, I would not normally turn up to um, give a presentation two days after we got the data, to be perfectly honest, but... Um, I just wanted to show you uh, some of that flip chipping you know, without uh, having gone through a little bit more um, in terms of the analysis. But it, was, it just seemed like an interesting thing. But, but you know, this, the increased power is actually very significant. It's sort of almost three times for the same device. I know it's going faster, but... Well, that's one of the missing elements in the modeling tools. <laughs> yeah, well, agreed. So actually, I didn't draw attention to it, but I think 
you know, one of the things we, we need is modeling that does all of this stuff. Um, so I, I perhaps didn't uh, draw attention to that. One of the conclusions is, yeah, okay, we need to be able to model everything together. All right, thank you. Cheers, thanks. <laughs>